11 years ago, she was a surprise victor in a by-election in Toronto's West End that few expected her to win. But very quickly, Sherry DeNovo put her mark on her party and the province. Civil rights, urban affairs, a higher minimum wage, poverty reduction. The member for Parkdale High Park has championed many big issues and managed to get past many private members' bills with all party support. She recently announced she'll step down at year's end, and so we're pleased to have Sherry DeNovo here to look back and forward. Great to have you in that chair. It's a pleasure. They say that politics is hard to get into and even harder to get out of. So how come you're leaving? Well, uh, four elections, 11 years, we've managed out of my office to pass more private members' bills than anybody in Ontario's history. Is that right? And more, yes, absolutely. As a fact check. Hmm. And also more uh, LGBTQ uh, legislation than anybody in Canada's history. I'm particularly proud of that. That's a pretty low bar, but we passed it. And that's been with all party support. So done my bit and now I think it's time to move on. I've known you for a while but have never seen you dress like this before. Um, you're a minister of the cloth, never a minister of the crown. How disappointing was that? Not disappointing at all. I'm very happy in opposition. Uh, I, I would uh, I would hate to have to you know uphold a government I didn't agree with. So I'm I, I like being in the critics' role politically, and I'm looking forward to going back to being a minister in a sanctuary in a church in a faith community. I'm, I suppose I should dispense with the easy cheap shot here, which is you've been such a long way from a sanctuary a sanctuary or a faith community at Queens Park, but that's mm -hmm. kind of true, isn't it? Well, it is and it isn't. I have nothing but respect for all my seatmates, no matter what party they're in. I, I think people go into politics with really the highest of expectations. They're, they could make more money somewhere else. They could work less hours somewhere else. We disagree on how to get there, on what should be done. But um, I actually feel a lot of compassion for everyone around that house. And that's one of the reasons I'm going back into ministry, actually, is because I think exactly that kind of person needs sanctuary, needs to be in a community that that loves them just for who they are and where, you know, the fight lessens. How did you get drawn to being a minister of the cloth to begin with? Uh, it was a series of, of, you know, changes in my life. Um, at that point, the father of my children died. Um, in the early 90s, I had my own successful business and there was a downturn in the economy. I thought I could start not all over again, but, you know, work twice as hard for half the billings or here's a real opportunity to do something different. And I was getting more and more involved in our church. Uh, so was my husband at that time, and kid's dad. Um, loved my church, loved the minister, didn't go in there even believing in God, uh, and really wanted to explore it more. I didn't know that I wanted to go through the ordination route, but turned out that I did. Why that church as opposed to any other? Um, you'd have to ask God that because honestly, most churches, if I'd walked in, I probably would have walked right out again. Um, but who was a wonderful minister, Ken Gallinger, writes for the Star now, uh, wonderful church and, uh, and really place to not get questions answered so much as to learn to add, ask the right questions. And that's what a faith community is. A lot of New Democrats, in my experience, don't believe in God at all. In fact, I would suspect of the mainline parties, there are more atheists among the NDP than either of the other two parties. Have you had those arguments with people in the caucus or in the broader membership? Oh, I don't argue about it. Okay, I'll give it some uh, I wrong mean, word. usually because usually because when somebody says I don't believe in God, I say, so what God don't you believe in? And that's usually not a God I believe in either. So that's where the discussion starts in in faith communities, and this is across faith. Uh, so that's where the discussion starts. It's it's a discussion. I always say, come in, you know. You know, God, the divine doesn't care what you believe in or not. The simple reality is that you should come into a community where you're loved, where you're accepted, where you can ask the questions, where you can have all the doubts in the world. Uh, that's what you should do. Even Jesus had doubts. But apparently, a little over a decade ago, you thought that you could make more of a difference in this world by getting into elective politics than you could in the ministry. Mm -hmm. How come? I think at that point I was right. I think at that point um, I saw poverty as a major hurdle for people in my congregation and I didn't see politicians doing much about it. So as you know, the very first bill I tabled was a $10 minimum wage bill. Now we're mm -hmm. fighting for 15, uh, but back then it was 10. It took us you know, a while to, to get there. Uh, but I mean, also, you know, Toby Dancer was the, the head of our choir, was a trans person who was our music director. When Toby died, we were the only sanctuary, I said it at that 
that point in the world that had a stained glass window of a trans person in the church. Somebody yelled out, what about Joan of Arc? Um, but I wanted to memorialize Toby too, because we didn't have trans rights in Ontario either. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time, it took me five tablings in about six years to finally get all party support for that. But we did it and we became the first biggest jurisdiction in North America to do so. And we've done other things since. So it's been good, I was right. You got the law named after Toby too, did you not? Yes. Toby's Law. Toby's Law. Yeah. Many Ontarians, I don't have to tell you, think that what you have done with your life for the past decade or more uh, was worthless. They think politics is a discredited profession. They think, well, they, I don't have to go through the list. You know what it is. How would you convince people that it's still something worth doing? Absolutely one of the highest callings to do public service. And as I said uh, just a minute ago, uh, I have the greatest respect for the people who take that really difficult world a road. There's no such thing as a lazy politician, let's put it that way. Uh, and they are people who really want to make a difference. And I would say to that person who is cynical about politics that in a sense we're all politicians. We should be all politicians. We should all take an active interest in what happens in our world, particularly now with climate change, with, uh, with you know, possible nuclear war. We're looking at a world that's very unstable. Get involved. My goodness, we should all be social justice activists and we should all be politicians. I know, though, that, that some people, um, politics is a team game mm -hmm. and you play it on a team. And I wonder, though, whether there are some things that would not have happened had Sherry DeNovo not been at Queen's Park to champion them. They wouldn't have happened. Can you give me a bit of a list? Well, all the queer I mean, legislation that we've passed, I mean, banning conversion therapy, parent equality, uh, Toby's Law, um, another bill coming up for Trans Day of Remembrance. Uh, I mean, I could go on PTSD coverage, uh, you know, for first responders. Eventually the government brought that in, but that was originally my bill, fought for five years. And the first question asked out of Patrick Brown's mouth when he was uh, elected leader was past Sherry's bill. Um, I think what people are, are fed up with, and I think with good reason, is the hyper-partisanship mm -hmm. that politics is about winning and not about getting something done for the electorate. Um, I'm kind of proof positive I'm not the only one to show you that you can co-author mm -hmm. bills with all three parties and get them done. You can work across partisan lines and get something positive happening. This is so important. And I think, you know, if we're, we've got to move forward, we've got to move forward in a nonpartisan way to, to actually make some changes in the world. And, and that's where I would agree with a little bit of cynicism on behalf of the electorate. But in the main, you were content to be a burr under the saddle of whoever was in power, encouraging and prodding, as opposed to being the decider? Well, and even my own party. As you know, I have been critical of my own party in the last provincial and the last federal election. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to tell the truth, that I've often said that in my own party and other places. I will not lie. I will tell the truth. And if the truth means that I'm breaking party discipline, then I will tell that truth. And there have been, I'm not alone again, a few incredibly brave examples from all parties who've done that over the 11 years I've been there. So I herald those people too. That makes you a fascinating individual, but it makes you difficult for whatever leader happens to be in place. And you were content to play that role? I was content to play that role. I'm, I'm still content to play that role. In fact, I'm freer now. I will be <laughs> freer once I leave the political spectrum to, to play that role and to be critical and to be critical in a nonpartisan way. Uh, I'm looking forward to that role because I'm still a social justice activist. Well, you're quite right. you started out trying to get that $10 minimum wage in and now you, you wanted 15 and 15 is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So are you claiming victory? Uh, yes, partial, absolutely. I'd like to see it happen sooner. Um, but, you know, yes, it's a good thing. Hmm. Finally. Uh, and no disappointment that you couldn't be the one standing up in the legislature saying, I'm the minister, I made the decision, I'm bringing it in. No, I want to be the person that that minister goes to when they feel like their life's falling apart and when they're exhausted uh, and when, uh, you know, they feel the, the, the knife coming from behind and not necessarily in front. I want to be that community for that person and, I, and help them that way rather than be the person shouting at them across the aisle. You know, because you have been not just a burr under the saddle of government but of your own party as well, uh, I, I imagine you've had some fairly testy conversations with the leader, Andrea Horvath, over the years. 
What's your relationship like right now? Listen, I have the greatest admiration for Andrea and any, especially woman, who takes on that role because they're few and far between. And yes, we've had our disagreements, but I think you'll see that we'll part friends. And I think that's, you know, the best of working relationships. It's like any working relationship you've had for 11 years. You're not going to agree about everything, but if you can walk away and shake hands and say, job well done to each other. It's a good day. You're, you're not going to agree on everything, but it's, there's a difference between that and going to a member of the media and saying, boy, did we blow this. And you did that. I, and I did that, but eventually we did that too. Eventually the provincial party uh, said exactly what I said to the media. I just said it a little earlier. Uh, <laughs> they said the same thing and replaced all those responsible just about for that election as well. So we, we agreed finally, and the same federally. You know, I was critical of our last federal election. Guess what happened? Um, we're now back on track. With Jagmeet Singh. I think we are. With you gone, or going, I guess I should say, you know, you look at the map of Toronto right now, there's a lot of red on that map. There's a little itty bit of blue, and there's not very much orange left at all anymore. What are the prospects, do you think, for the NDP in this city now? Well, I think there's a great deal of, <laughs> of upside for us. Uh, obviously, not a lot of downside, but also because I think there's a, sh a, a genuine shift uh, and I think the Liberals have shown that genuine shift. I mean, Trudeau ran to the left to win. Um, certainly Kathleen Wynne is bringing in a lot of social democratic policies just before the election, but she's doing it. Um, it shows you where the electorate is at. I think the electorate's demanding social justice, they're demanding change, and they're very aware of inequality. They're aware that their lives and the lives of their children are not what they should be. That desire for change is definitely out there. So if we do the right things, run the right kind of campaign, I think there's a very large upside for the NDP. We talked about this in the previous session, but I should mm -hmm. ask about it in, in, in terms of the provincial lens as well. Sure. Because Kathleen Wynne has run such, as many people would suggest, a left-wing government, I think there are people out there who are wondering, why do we need the NDP anymore anyway? The Liberals have basically stolen their agenda and are running on it as if it were their own. So what do we need the provincial NDP for anyway? Well, she privatized Hydro One. We need the, the provincial NDP to not do uh, that. We need the provincial NDP to stand up labor laws. I remember Bill 115, which was very anti-teacher. No, Kathleen wasn't in power then, but still, that was the Liberal Party. Um, uh, uh, certainly, uh, they have sided with Bay Street many times over Main Street. I think we need a party that sides with Main Street and, and is a real labor party, a party that represents working class folk, that represents I'm going to say the word socialism, democratic socialism. That's what we need. Um, we've seen it in the States with Bernie Sanders. We've seen it in the UK with Jeremy Corbyn. We need to be that party in the Canadian context. Unambiguously so. Unambiguous. So you so. think the Liberals are still playing footsie with capitalism? They're playing footsie. They're more, more than footsie occasionally. Hmm. <laughs> Is it true? I read this and I thought, I didn't know this, and I want to ask you about it directly because sure. I didn't know this. You performed the first legal same-sex marriage in Canada? First legalized same-sex marriage, and probably in North America. I can verify that, but uh, certainly in Canada, yes. How'd that happen? Well, it was very simple. I married two wonderful women. Two women of color, by the way, uh, and because we were a United Church, um, their names uh, and the old form in those days just said bride and groom, didn't say male and female. Put their names in, sent it into the Registrar General's office, prayed over it, and guess what? The Holy Spirit was at work because they vetted it. They thought that Paula, P-A-U-L-A, was a man's name, and they vetted it, and they had the you know marriage license to show for it. CBC came, Toronto Star came. Bang. We were the first legalized same-sex marriage, and still is. Uh, how astonished are you at how that issue has evolved over the last decade? I'm thrilled. I, I mean, that was a fight that I and many, many more were engaged in, and we won. We won. Um, uh, that's a very sweet victory, and it's a, it, it's a fight that, you know, you look at the world, 80 countries still have laws against homosexuality. Uh, about a dozen have the death penalty, and the U.S. just voted with them, by the way, to uphold that death penalty. So there's a lot of work to be done, but We've come a long way in Ontario, and we've come a long way in Canada. Certainly in the last few years, you have really planted your flag as the foremost champion of trans rights. And uh, let's just play a clip here. This was, uh, how long ago was this? This is three years ago, three years ago this month, actually, that you said the following on this program. Sheldon, if you would.
It doesn't take a great leap of imagination to imagine yourself um, as somebody, someone different. You don't have to be a person of color to know that racism is bad. You don't have to be a trans person to know that transphobia is wrong. I mean, again, this is kind of common sense, I would hope. But what, what you're pointing to, which I think is very important, is education. And that is something that we discussed before the show, and we all agree that's something, that's the next step. We really need to have a better educational program for all of these issues in our schools and beyond. Mm -hmm. Three years ago last month. I guess I have seen you in the color before. You I forgot have. about that. And I forgot I, about that too. I forgot about that. How would you characterize the state of trans rights in the province today? Far, far better than they were back then. Um, we have GSAs. We've banned conversion Gain therapy. Straight alliances? Yes, mm -hmm. and we've uh, banned conversion therapy, which was very much being practiced on the trans community back then. Um, that's a huge leap forward. We have parent equality, which we didn't have back then, so some trans parents had to adopt their own children. Certainly lesbians had to adopt their own children back then. So we've made some giant steps. And certainly educationally, we have non-gendered washrooms in our schools now. We have a whole training program. We have a new sex ed curriculum since then. I mean, it's amazing what we've accomplished in three years. For people in this province who kind of liked the way things were back in the day, how do you deal with them? Well, with compassion and with love. That's how you, you always deal with difference. Um, that's how you always overcome hate. Uh, with education, with compassion, with love. And I've seen it many, many, for many years in the church, of course. Uh, you know, I was very, very upstream when I first was in the pulpit and first performed the first legalized same-sex marriage. There were lots of resistance, including from my own denomination, um, who did not stand up for me when I performed that marriage. Uh, so it's been a long road, and it's been a road of education and of love and compassion, of listening, of, uh, and of waiting because, you know, ultimately when you stand with the marginalized, um, here's the thing, you will win. It takes a while. It takes a while, but you will win. Let's finish up on this. What do you now hope to accomplish at, uh, is it Trinity St. Paul's? Yes. In your new mission that you couldn't do at Queen's Park? Well, I hope to create a sanctuary along with them, uh, a sanctuary for folk who are stressed, uh, I consider Queen's Park part of my parish still and mm -hmm. University of Toronto. Uh, so for students, but also for queers right across North America, a center for queer evangelism, a center for queer conferences on queer theology. Uh, we really have a lot of work to do to show that that Bible, which most five billion out of the seven billion people in the world are Christian, Muslim, or Jewish, and look to that book in some way, shape, or form to inform them about issues like LGBTQ issues, to do some educational work around that. It's such an important, important venture because people are dying. And they're dying um, not so much here anymore, although they still are, but around the world. And we have to stop that. And we could start by looking at that foundational book that informs so much still uh, and, and you know really upholding it as a queer positive book and a queer positive faith all of ours are. Sherry DeNovo, we wish you well with your new mission. And uh, we congratulate you on leaving footprints uh, over the last decade and more in public life. It's been a pleasure. Sherry DeNovo, the outgoing NDP member for Parkdale High Park. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.